Hello, I'm Julian Bugini, philosopher and writer, and I'm talking today about the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Now, I must say, a mischievous part of me wants to call it something else, like the cosmically illogical argument. And although that may seem very irreverent and a bit disrespectful, I just want to say a little bit about why I think there's something to be said for that. You know, in philosophy, generally speaking, we treat arguments with respect, whether we agree with them or not. And it's a good methodological principle to kind of assume that what you're arguing with or against has its merits and to try and take it in its strongest version. But I think with the historical arguments for the existence of God, such as the cosmological argument, but also the ontological argument and the teleological argument or the so-called argument from design, I think actually there's something slightly dishonest about this because to be honest with you, nobody really thinks they're very good at all. I say nobody, that's not true. There are some theist philosophers, people who already have a strong religious conviction who seem to think they're interesting, but the vast majority of philosophers don't. And to be honest, even a lot of religious philosophers don't think they're very interesting. Take this uh, comment, Peter Vardy, he is a philosopher, he is a Christian theist. He's written lots of textbooks to help people get through their school exams on things like the cosmological argument. But even he says of these arguments, they're a waste of time. I actually think they're boring because I don't think religion rests on them. You don't get someone saying, well, I thought there was a 68% chance that God exists, but I've just read an article in the Philosopher's Magazine, which has increased the probability to 7%, so I'm off to be a Jesuit. That's ridiculous. And of course he's right. So to say these arguments aren't very good isn't to say that religion has no merits, there are no reasons to be religious. It's to say that whatever reasons there might be, these aren't it. And in a way it does religion a disservice to treat these arguments as though they were somehow important for it, because they're, they're really not. If it were the case that religious people relied upon these arguments for their belief, then it would be true that religious people just weren't the brightest buttons in the bag. But that just ain't the case. So although it may seem a bit disrespectful to say these arguments are very poor and very weak, um, I actually think it's worth being a bit honest about that and not, not to pretend that people treat them with more respect than they actually do. But let's get into the argument. Why don't people like it? What's wrong with it? Well, we talk about the cosmological argument. In fact, there are many, many variations of it. I think the basic structure of the cosmological argument is something like this. It starts with a basic principle that everyone may think is incontrovertible, that everything must have a cause. Now, if everything must have a cause, then the universe must have a cause. And that cause can't be the universe itself course, because if the universe caused itself, you'd be defying the principle that everything must have a cause. You can't just say some things cause themselves. So therefore, that cause has got to be something else. Only God is powerful enough to be this cause, and therefore God exists. That's your cosmological argument in a nutshell. Now, interestingly, if you haven't really thought about this before, if you're new to it, you might think there's something to it. You might think there's something impressive, but it's actually pretty weak, as I think we can see by examining some of these premises a little bit more carefully. Let's start with the very first one, everything must have a cause. Well, of course, if that is true, then you can't end up concluding that, that God exists unless God has a cause. So at this point, of course, people say, well, everything must have a cause, except that which is capable of causing itself. But our God is that thing. God is the one thing in the universe that is the cause of itself. And therefore you get out of that cycle. But the problem there, of course, is that if you're saying that God is the exception to this rule, it's not really a rule. It's not true that everything must have a cause. And if it's not true that everything must have a cause because God wasn't caused, well, why is God the only thing that doesn't have a cause? Why can't the universe just be one of those things that doesn't have a cause? Why can't the cause of the universe be the universe itself? If God can be the cause of God itself, why can't the universe be the cause of itself? Now again, of course, people will get into very, very detailed arguments about why God is different and so forth. But I think this is all rather weak. Um, the idea that this is an argument for the existence of God really sort of vanishes if, if in order to uphold it, you've got to find some way of just describing God such as God is the only thing that breaks the rule that your argument depends upon. The second is the idea that only God is powerful enough to be this cause. Let's say we allow that everything must have a cause, 
but that there must be something at the beginning of the causal chain which is the cause of itself, which isn't the universe itself. Why God? And again, this is a rather uh, decisive argument, I think, because the point is saying that God is the only thing that could fulfill that role is rather uh, begging the question. Uh, we have no idea, perhaps. Maybe it's true that the universe requires a cause which is uncaused. But to think that that thing resembles the God of traditional religion seems to be making a very, very huge assumption. This idea that God is powerful enough to be the cause. Uh, Descartes, in his meditations, argued for this. And the argument Descartes offered here was a version of one which was already popular in philosophy beforehand, a lot of the medieval philosophers. Um, something which is called the causal reality principle sometimes. And he said, well, look, there must be at least as much reality in the efficient and total cause as in the effect of that cause. To put it perhaps another way, something cannot arise from nothing, and what is more perfect cannot arise from what is less perfect. So the idea here is that there must be at least as much in the cause as is in the effect. You can't get effects which are greater than their causes. And that's kind of why you have to end up with your ultimate cause being something like God. It has to be something that has more power, potency, more properties, more reality, whatever you want to call it, than the rest of creation. And that's why it seems reasonable to people like Descartes to assume that that thing must be, uh, God. only God can fit that bill. Well, again, this is rather weak because actually, you know, the, the idea of God that we have in the theistic tradition, the traditions of the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, that's only one conception of God. So the idea that the first cause, even if you believe that the first cause must be this super powerful thing which has more reality than the whole of the universe put together, it's still a very far way from being the personal God that we recognise in religion. But also, it's not evident at all that this is true, that this causal reality principle is true. Why can't it be the case, rather, that causes and effects can go any other way, other way around? That something can be greater than its cause, that complexity can... You know, so if you think about evolution, for example, evolution gives rise to things which are much, much more complex than how the universe began. We began with just a few simple things, a few simple elements, no complex life forms at all. And the universe gained complexity in the form of its sort of animal and vegetable life. David Hume, I think, was one of the great philosophers to really sort of get to the bottom of what's wrong with the cosmological argument. And here's a principle which he gave in, in various forms, that our ideas reach no further than our experience. We have no experience of divine attributes and operations. What Hume is really saying is that in all these arguments, not just the cosmological argument for the existence of God, people are attributing to causes of the universe, of the appearance of order in the universe, whatever it might be, more than they're entitled to. We're only entitled to base our conclusions about how things began on the basis of our experience. Now, our experience is extremely limited. It's limited to what we see in this material world. So in a way, to go beyond that and to say, ah, I, I, I see evidence here of something greater and beyond, is to go beyond what experience tells us in a very, very fundamental way. It's speculative, essentially. And speculation has its place. And if you want to speculate there is a God on the basis that we have no idea where the universe began and maybe it's a something like God, that's one thing. That's very, very far from having a good argument for the existence of God. Here's another thing that Hume says to, which really makes that point. That a stone will fall, that a fire will burn, that the earth has solidity, we've observed a thousand and a thousand times. But wherever you depart in the least from the similarity of the cases, you diminish proportionably the evidence and may at last bring it to a very weak analogy, which is confessibly liable to error and uncertainty. So again, this is what a kind of thing he'd say that Descartes was doing. Descartes basing his conclusions about cause and effect on what he observes about cause and effect in the universe, but he's just observing a very small part of nature. He hasn't got experience of how universes begin. 
So whenever he's kind of saying, well, look, we know cause and effect works in this way from what we see on Earth, therefore, surely it must have worked this way when it came to the origins of the universe, he's simply going far beyond what experience taught him. Now, at this point, people who are more persuaded of the truth of these arguments may say, well, you've only really touched the most simple versions of them. There are more complicated ones, and indeed it's true. There's a whole industry of creating versions of these arguments. One is known as a Kalam cosmological argument, so-called after Kalam being a form of Islamic scholastic theology in the Middle, a Middle Ages, and William Lane Craig has formulated a version of this for our times. There's a summary of this which was produced by Bruce Ruckenbach in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a very good resource if you want to use it. And here it is. I won't go through it in detail. You can have a you can just pause your video and look at it if you want to examine it. But again, it, it, it's just it's slightly more complicated perhaps. But again, the basic problems are the same as they are for all versions of it. I mean, first of all, this argument assumes that the universe began to exist. Well, did it? I mean, you could say that that's what modern physics tells us. There was a big bang. But in this kind of cosmological sense, in the full sense of the word, you know, everything that is or ever has been, we don't know whether what this universe is part of. This, the universe came from something. Did it come from nothing? Is it part of a cycle of universes, a sequence of big bangs that have occurred? Did that begin to exist at some point? In other words, if you think about creation as a whole, to use that metaphorical term, did it begin? We just don't know. And you certainly can't argue that just as a principle of logic. Another point about this argument is it talks about what explanation can and cannot do. And he asserts here that no scientific explanation can provide a coarse account of the origin of the universe. Well, again, I'm not sure that's true either. Uh, we may not have one yet, but what science can and can't, cannot demonstrate remains to be seen. And simply asserting that there will never be a scientific explanation of the beginnings of the universe may be assuming something that you can't do. But even so, what is an explanation? What does it mean to explain? Well, all explanations at some point reach their end. Once you've described something so far, if you say, well, why, 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 you always reach a point where you can go no further with it. And it may be we reach that point with explanations of how the universe began. It may well be there comes a point where we can explain no further. But to push that back and say, well, that's a reason to say we have to postulate a God behind it, is simply pushing that question one stage back, because then you can say, well, why is there a God? And if you can't explain that, isn't that an inadequate explanation? So we have to be aware that when we're asking for an explanation of how the universe began, how it developed, there are limits to those explanations. And I think what's the really striking thing about this argument, though, is it concludes that because there is no scientific explanation of the origins of the universe, that the cause must be personal. It must be some kind of agent. And that seems to be a huge, huge leap because even if we accepted the fact that we can't scientifically explain how the universe began, it doesn't follow that the only thing that could have created it must be some kind of person. It could be something we have no idea what it is. And in fact, it'd be very strange for it to be personal in a way. It seems to be a very anthropomorphic way of thinking about the universe, that because the only thing we can imagine as a cause other than a scientific cause is some kind of massive being like ourselves, and that must be it. A very weak uh, move, I would suggest. So let's get back to Hume again. So I think Hume sort of sums up the problems very neatly. In a way, this is repeating what I said earlier. Hume said, when we infer any particular cause from an effect, we must proportion the one to the other and can never be allowed to ascribe to the cause any qualities but what are exactly sufficient to produce the effect. This is what reasoning from cause to effect demands. And the fundamental problem with the cosmological argument is that it attributes to the cause of the universe much, much, much more than we are justified in doing based on our experience. Because there's nothing in our experience at all which tells us the cause of the universe must be a kind of personal agent, a being with desires and interests who resembles the god of religion. This is what Hume thinks happens when people get carried away with arguments like this and others. You find certain phenomena in nature. You seek a cause or author. 
you imagine that you have found him. You afterwards become so enamoured of this offspring of your brain that you imagine it impossible that he must produce something greater and more perfect than the present scene of things, which is so full of ill and disorder. So in other words here, what Hume is saying is that if you assume there is a creator God behind this, you notice the world is actually deeply imperfect. But that doesn't matter. We're imagining that what God has created in its totality is beautiful and perfect. In other words, we attribute to the creation of this creator much, much more than we see. To continue the quote, you forget that this superlative intelligence and benevolence are entirely imaginary, or at least without any foundation in reason, and that you have no ground to ascribe to him any qualities, but what you see he has actually exerted and displayed in his productions. That, I think, perhaps gets to the bottom of this and, and shows perhaps one of the major problems with the cosmological argument. It's interesting to engage with, for philosophical reasons, but the, to go back to what I said at the beginning, I wouldn't want anyone to think that religion stands and falls on the basis of arguments like these. It doesn't, and I also wouldn't like anyone to think that this is philosophy at its best, because it isn't. Thank you.